Uh, you mentioned just then that um, the, the difficulty at schools and um, the media has kind of documented falling rates of young people um, choosing science subjects at schools. Uh, I was wondering what you think about how we can make science more appealing at, at schools. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because when you look at the statistics, you, know, you come out of primary school and you love science and you think science is really interesting and, and all through primary school most children really like science. And then between the ages of 10, 11 and 14, that drops off. And as soon as they're given the chance, um, massive amounts of students just drop the science subject straight away. And there's, I think I mean, there's all kinds of reasons for that. You know, but it's, it's a complicated issue. One of them, I think, is that science is, is portrayed as being really dry and dull. Um, that you, you just kind of never hear the good stuff, effectively, about what scientists get up to. And, you know, every child who studies art knows that Van Gogh cut his ear off and went mad, you know. And you're never allowed to hear about the things that scientists get up to. You know, and scientists do extraordinary things. They do experiments on themselves. You know, they, they take drugs. They do uh, weird things in order to have ideas. You know, they fight with each other and they lie and they cheat and they kind of try and get one over on each other. And, uh, of course, science lessons are just all about learning Ohm's law. You know, V equals IR. And if you learn that properly and learn how to do it, then you'll pass your GCS in science. That doesn't actually, it's not useful. We're training people as if they're going to all be scientists. Actually, what we want is a kind of an appreciation of the culture of science and where science has got us. And if you start doing that, as you do with art and, and other subjects that they do stick with and they love, despite the fact they're not going to earn them any money, then actually, you know, you'd start getting more and more people taking up science. You know, we have a problem where we get them to do experiments in the classroom and then... <clears throat> You know, we tell them they've either got it right or wrong. It's not about having done the experiment and have the experience of getting it wrong. It's about whether they got the right answer at the end mm. or didn't get the right answer. And studies have shown that if uh, you, you do things with students and they continually get things wrong or don't uh, achieve the levels that are supposed to, they're supposed to, then they will just drop those subjects and go for the easier ones. Like, you know, write an essay. It's not right or wrong. It's like this essay was weak here. It could have been stronger there. And uh, you didn't make the argument very well there. And it's much less sort of black and white, whereas with science and math subjects, you know, they get it wrong enough, and they just say, you know what, I'll go and do English, because it's, you know, I don't get that wrong all the time. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to actually uh, ask you, we were talking about uh, scientists, and you were talking about um, the scientists that, that, that are, you know, current scientists that do these sort of kind of crazy things that are interesting. Could you sort of give us an example of the kind of people that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um... Scientists who do ridiculous things include um, Carrie Mullis, who took LSD in order to have a good idea, effectively. So he, he said that um, <coughs> what he did was, and this won him a Nobel Prize, he invented a way to copy DNA really quickly. Um, it's a thing called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, and it's the technology behind like DNA fingerprinting that the police do and everything else. And um, uh, what he did, he wanted to work out a way in which you could just copy it, you know, pull apart a strand of DNA and copy it. And uh, he trained his brain using hallucinogenic drugs so that he could imagine himself sitting down there on the molecule, as he called it, you know, <laughs> typical sort of Californian. I was, like, mm -hmm. was down there on the molecule and I saw it. And he would like, imagine himself, you know, through sort of training his brain to visualize strange things, um, imagine himself sort of ripping it apart and how you put it back together again. And, of course, you know, this is not a story that anybody wants, you know, in the scientific <laughs> establishment, it kind of wants coming out. It's like, you know, even though it was a Nobel Prize winning thing, you know, done through hallucinogenic drugs, you know, which is fine if you're a writer or an artist. You know, everybody expects them to do things like this. But actually, you know, the fact that scientists do things like this is yeah, yeah. meant to be sort of, you know, brushed under the carpet, as it were. So yeah. uh, that's one thing. I mean, Barry Marshall won a Nobel Prize for discovering that certain types of spiral bacteria um, cause stomach ulcers. And until then, everyone said it was just stress and smoking and everything else, lifestyle <coughs> things. And, uh, but the only way he could prove it was to actually do the experiment on himself. So he drank this cup full of bacteria and um, made himself really, really ill and nearly died as it, as it happened. But um, it, it actually, you know, the infection took hold in his stomach and he was able to do all the experiments to show what the infection was and then you know, analyse everything that was in his stomach and then and showed that this, this was uh, caused by the bacteria that he got this, these ulcers. And, uh, and that won him a Nobel Prize and nearly killed him, but it was worth it. That's what he said. So, uh, so, so, you know, scientists do extraordinary things and, and you never get to hear it. I mean, cutting your ear off is nothing compared to other <coughs> things. Uh, I think I've done that experiment in a Chinese restaurant in 
So are, are these people that are alive now? Yeah, it's yeah, a current yeah. 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 uh, so That's one of the other things with the science like, yeah. perception of scientists is like a lot of kids' perception is that it's kind of a bunch of dead yeah, old yeah, guys yeah. like Newton with floppy wigs yeah, and that sort yeah. of thing. Well, what, one of the problems is that, that you know, what I term brand science, you know, the scientific establishment, has kind of you know colluded in this thing where they want to seem trustworthy and responsible and, and you know you, you can you can leave your you know atomic bombs with us they'll be safe because people were really worried about science after the second world war and, and so there was a whole kind of big PR effort to kind of make science look look trustworthy again because you know you'd have the experiments on the Allied soldiers you know mustard gas and nerve gas you know the, the atomic bombs the V2 rockets so they, it was all science and science kind of terrified people after the second yeah. world war. And so they did this sort of, you know, very upright kind of PR stunt for sort of 20 or 30 years, and then people started to trust science properly. But that's left you sort of with the kind of, you know, just the white-haired old gentleman, you know, of science, because they were the only ones who were allowed to kind of appear in public and do all this stuff and, and be the public face of science. So you had, you know, the people going on TV were the ones you could trust, to, you know, to be, you know, responsible and trustworthy. I mean, now it's changed a bit because you've got people like Brian Cox, you know, and Michael Mosley, sort of a bit younger and a bit hipper. But um, for years and years, certainly through my youth, it was science was done by old white men, usually with white hair, because that's all you ever saw. That was the public face of science. And this is one of the, again, one of the problems with education is that, is that you know, when kids study science, all they think of as a scientist, and, they, and they've done the research to show this, you ask kids to draw a scientist, and they draw an old man, usually with facial hair, glasses, white coat, you know, it's an absolute classic kind of thing. And the funny thing is that, that, that it, this whole myth has taken hold so well that if you ask adults to do it, that's, that, that's the scientist they draw. And then you ask scientists to draw scientists, and they draw the same kind of shorthand. <laughs> and, it, and it is just a shorthand, this is what we think of as science. But of course, for kids coming up, this is all they ever see, it's like, this is what a scientist looks like. And so you get the mad evil scientists in all the kids' cartoons, and he's always slightly Germanic. And he's always yeah. very, because the Germans were the ones you shouldn't trust up. You know, so it, became, yeah. it took hold this idea that mad scientists were German, like Werner von Braun, who, you know, who built the V2 rockets and things like this. And so you've got this whole culture where the scientists are these kind of weird caricatures. And actually, you know, you can go into any sort of university, laboratory, and you'll find people of all ages, all genders, you know, some will be incredibly nerdy, and some will be quite cool. And, you know, the whole spectrum of humanity is there. And this needs to come out. And one of the problems with, you know, the fact that kids are turning off between 10 and 14 is that's exactly the time in their lives they're learning to be rebellious. They're turning into teenagers. They're learning to take risks. They're learning that adults don't know everything. And they're starting to experiment with sort of, you know, disrespecting their parents and disrespecting the men in the street that they come across and behaving badly. And actually what they're doing is effectively all the things that scientists still do. You know, <laughs> the, you know the drug taking, the risk taking, the alcohol, you know, the kind of, you know, not respecting your colleagues and having fights with them. You know, the scientists are effectively like teenagers who just got stuck there. And, uh, and, and so what better way to kind of engage teenagers in science than say, you know, do you know what, these scientists, they're just like you. And all of a sudden you've got role models, and, and you see role models, and you think, do you know what, I could do science. Whereas at the moment, everyone says, science is not for me. Because you, know, you don't want to turn into that white-haired, you know, boring old gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned something in, um, I watched a video of you talking about the anarchy of science. On yeah. videos, and you talked about this kind of worry that the future generations of sciences will be um, devoid of the extroverts yeah, uh, yeah. and things like that because of this... Yeah, so th this is an amazing study. And what's amazing to me is that, like, it's the only study of its kind. Nobody's followed up on it, nobody's done anything with it. But this study showed that when you give school kids the chance to drop science, the extroverts, the highly socialised kids, all drop it. They just all drop the science subjects and go with the humanities. And, but the timid kids, the introverts, the shy kids, they stick with science. Or they're the only ones who stick with science. And so what that translates to, ten years down the line, you're producing a generation of scientists who are introverted, you know, personality-wise. Not saying there's anything wrong with being like that, but you don't have extroverts. You don't have scientists who will go out and take risks and do stupid things, which is exactly what you need if you want to make a breakthrough. So we're actually raising a generation of scientists who will be, you know, conservative with a small C and do, you know, sort of careful, cautious experiments and not make breakthroughs and not do the, the things that actually will win the Nobel Prizes effectively. So, so you know, you sort of think. When we've got to solve problems like climate change and the lack of energy and the fact that there's not enough water for everyone on the planet, especially when we get to 10 billion people on the planet, then you don't want the cautious 
kids, you know, having grown up and become the new generation of scientists. You're going to need somebody who thinks differently and thinks adventurously and boldly and kind of says, you know, let's go in this direction and, and kind of is a leader. You know, you need the extroverts. And uh, at the moment, we're in danger of them not coming through. So, you know, we won't be able to solve the problem. So, I th that worries me. I, I can't believe more people aren't getting worried about that. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, that's pretty good. Yeah, all right. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks for your time. That's all right, yeah. I was going to ask you what's like your favourite breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>